live in very interesting times, don't we? The iconic American institution has melted. General Motors is bankrupt and being bailed out by the taxpayers, which is indicative that business as usual cannot endure. If businesses continue the way that they have, they will go broke as well, and the earth will be faced with crisis after crisis after crisis. This is our choice. We can either change how we do business or we will just get to respond to these crises. Indeed, the unsustainability of the way we do business now was the underlying cause of the financial collapse that we may now be finally crawling out of. And if we do not address that fundamental unsustainability, this recovery will simply be the precursor to the next collapse. Because we were borrowing $2 billion a day to buy oil. Think about it, $2 billion a day of American money going overseas, and then we send that money overseas to buy imported oil. And guess what? Toyota's profits were about exactly Ford's losses. Because people were buying the more fuel efficient cars that Toyota was offering. China. If China continues to grow economically at the rate that it was before the collapse and uses resources as efficiently as the United States, they're now fourfold less. By 2030, they will want more oil than the world now lifts or can ever lift. And more cars and coal and cotton and concrete. I mean, at that rate, the future is not possible. Climate change. Very, very much for real. It is everywhere now across the planet, but one of the real concerns is what's happening in the Himalaya, where the glaciers are melting. That waters 40% of the people on Earth. The Murray-Darling Basin in Australia now runs dry. It used to produce, pr provide water to make rice, which fueled the second largest rice mill in Asia. And when that collapsed, that was what triggered the food riots. It got blamed on ethanol. And indeed, if you do ethanol in a stupid way, if you do biofuels in a stupid way, if you do electric power plants for electric cars in a stupid way, you can cause problems. But the cause of the collapse was climate change. This is from this week's news, the dust storms in Australia. Australia is perhaps the face of climate change. And it's not only affecting us. It is affecting all the world's creatures. The floods in Atlanta last week. Again, this is, these are today's news stories. It is happening. It's here. It's real. It's hurting us. And as a result, we have growing food and water shortages. Eric de Carbonell points out that China is days away from famine. India had to import food this year because of climate change. My friend Bill Becker says, if we insist on ruining the planet, we're going to have to stop claiming we're a superior species. <laughs> and the business leader, Ray Anderson, puts it a bit more simply, what's the business case for ending life on Earth? Here's another challenge coming at us. Matt Simmons, he is not an environmentalist. He's a Houston oil banker points out that the extraction history of the supergiant oil fields looks very like a theory put forth by the Shell Oil geologist in the 1950s, a guy named M. King Hubbard, who pointed out that if you have a finite resource, it's a corollary of the round earth theory that oil is finite, and you have exponentially growing demand, exponentially growing demand, 90% of the oil ever used by people has been since 58, half since 84. Hubbard said you will fall off the production curve as steeply as you went up when you have extracted half the oil. Yes, there's a lot more oil underground. What's gone is our ability to extract it at a cheap price point. So business, as usual, cannot continue. We're running out. If we continue at current consumption rates, 33 years, drill, baby, drill, that's three years' worth. And if the whole world used oil at the rate that the U.S. now does, that's about six years' worth. We have a very narrow window to change how we move people around the planet. 
The U.S. uses 25 percent of the world's oil. We have about 3 percent of it on our own soil, so we import 60 percent of our oil, and that is going up. Jim Woolsey, who used to run the CIA, says if uh, you know, we're, we're fighting both sides of the war on terror, we're paying for our guys buying oil from the guys who pay for the other guys. This is really silly. How many more wars around the world do we want to have because of our dependence on oil? Maybe it's time to rethink how we move people around the planet. There are only four nations in the world that produce more carbon than the U.S. vehicle fleet. And the vehicle fleets around the world are projected to increase dramatically, nearly quadruple to three billion cars, China, India, and they have a right to the same sort of high quality of life that we have. But if all the world's people try to meet these aspirations using last century's technologies, we crash the planet. Transportation, yeah, it's a really good thing to be able to move stuff and people around. <laughs> and when you go to the rest of the world, you, you realize how valuable transportation is. We drive for a lot of reasons. It's fun. Cars are a status symbol. We have to get somewhere on time. We can, do, we can move around in different ways, though. Before we talk about any kind of car, I mean, we're in a car museum. Before we talk about cars, before we talk about what we put into the cars, we need to talk first about how we design the transportation systems. What is the whole system? Used to be able, in fact, I, I'm sure there's one here, a red car. Used to be able to go from Boston to St. Louis on trolley cars. In Amsterdam, Copenhagen, tens of thousands of people commute every day by bicycle. High-speed trains. There are lots of ways to move around. Well over a quarter of all automobile travel, miles traveled are getting to and from work, and well more than three quarters are one person, one car. Transportation is the fastest growing sector impacting climate change. And we don't need the car. If we create walkable neighborhoods, if we design better transit systems, we don't necessarily ever have to get in a car. We can also share cars. Car sharing programs are growing rapidly, cuts your cost dramatically. Just owning a car is about $30,000 a year. So split it between a couple people. There are now whole cities being designed to be car free. Uh, Vauban in, uh, in Germany, people are selling their cars in order to move there. Mazdar, a city being built in Abu Dhabi, will be entirely car free. We'll have a very sophisticated personal transit system, but it won't be cars. It will, by the way, be zero waste and entirely solar powered as well. And the Arabs see this as the source of their innovation, their technology, when the oil runs out. They are already leapfrogging to the future. You don't even necessarily have to go. It's really cool to be able to sit at home in your jammies and have a video conference halfway around the world. This company, CityIS, provides these little devices you hook onto your own laptop and wherever you are, airport or anywhere else, you can have a video conference. If we still want to drive, the key to a transport se sector is super efficient cars. Before we talk about what we pour into it, let's ensure that those cars are efficient because no transport system based around cars makes any sense if we are driving inefficient vehicles. It's happening. FedEx is building hybrid vehicle fleets. UPS is doing the same thing. Improved fuel efficiency by 44 percent, cuts the emissions. There are schemes to power electric cars. And I know Ed, you've, you, Ed's been a great fan of electric cars. Shai Agassi has this scheme to have solar power panels on battery swap out stations. They've got, this one's up and working in Yokohama, Japan. Is this the answer? I don't know. The Europeans, I was just at the Frankfurt Motor Show 
and uh, Siemens gave a presentation on a, a pan-European smart grid based on solar all across the north of Africa, wind power off the Danish and German coasts, wave power off of Scotland, and distributed generation all across Europe, feeding into grids that will then deliver a higher quality of life in communities across Europe. I was on the podium with Clinton and Branson when Branson said he's putting the profits of the Virgin Group for the next 10 years into carbon neutral fuels. And the media came running up and said, why? He said, look, I run an airline, I'm going to need fuel, and we live in a carbon constrained world. And I said, and he's going to make a boatload of money. And he's doing it. He is already flying planes on biofuel. Air New Zealand has flown it, Virgin has flown it. This is not a red or a blue issue. This is not about politics. I mentioned Jim Woolsey. He is a very conservative guy. He ran the CIA. He drives a plug-in hybrid car that he fuels from the solar panels on his roof with a bumper sticker on the back that says, Osama bin Laden hates my car. He sees this as an issue of national security. I think he's right. <clears throat> Ethanol has a critical role to play. It is something that you can make at home. And in fact, we have a little still sitting here making ethanol. The book that David has written, Alcohol Can Be a Gas, ought to be required reading for anyone who cares about the future. This is the definitive book. I mean, it, <laughs> A friend of mine said it to me and said, what do you think? I was like, huh, looks like a cartoon book. <laughs> Ethanol, hmm. And I started reading it and realized this guy knows what he's talking about. It is extensively documented. It's got enough facts and figures in it to choke any academic. And they're good sources. I had my researchers go and look up the sources. Did the sources say what David is quoting them to say? And they do. This is now the definitive book. Anybody who cares about how to fuel our future. Very, very fine book. But it's not new. Henry Ford reckoned we'd run the vehicle fleet on ethanol. He said, you can make an eth ethanol out of that sumac down by the road, or apples, or weeds, or sawdust, almost anything. And ethanol is coming up in production. It's growing very rapidly. It's critical, though, again, that we think in a whole systems approach. Taking lots of federal money and throwing it at 150-year-old distillation technology and unsustainably grown corn is probably not the way that we want to fuel our vehicles. And many of the criticisms that have been leveled against alcohol come because there was a gold rush into last century's technologies. We don't have to do it that way. And what David lays out in the book is a whole systems approach to providing power, fuel for our cars, our communities, and solving a lot of other problems at the same time. If we base an alcohol fuel system around local production, local production of food, local production of fuel, from people you know, your neighbors, the farmer down the street, you are now preserving American culture. We're preserving the values that this country was built upon, and we are guaranteeing sustainable systems and power for the future. Brazil is an interesting example. During the 70s, Brazil was importing over 80% of its oil, even more than we are now. And in 75, they implemented a national alcohol program. They had four policies. They required that the major oil company purchase a certain amount of the fuel, they gave loans at low interest, they gave some subsidies, and they required that all fuels be at least partly blended with alcohol. Brazil is now the second largest producer behind the US, became net energy independent in 2006. We can get off imported oil. This is not the way it has to be, and it's not the way we want it to be. We don't have to be borrowing two billion dollars a day to buy imported oil. We can be making our own fuels. Corn's not the only or best feedstock. 
One of my favorites are the lipid algaes. You can grow these things in, in vertical columns. You can even take the exhaust from coal plants and run it through if you want to use the CO2 twice. But let's think about this in a bigger sense. If you go back to the first industrial revolution when we invented commerce, we used water power to make iron and textiles, and then we moved on to steam power and trains and steel. Who did that? What was the country that created the first industrial revolution? England. England. And England ruled the world. England ruled the waves. England was the dominant political, economic, and military power during that time. And then we moved on. The US discovered oil, and we invented electricity, and chemicals, and cars. Who did that? America. And America went on with petrochemicals, and the space race, and the IT revolution. I mean, who would have thought we all needed these little things in our pockets that have 3,000 songs on them? Evidently, we all do. What's next? We all going to be burger flippers? What is this country going to be based upon? If the next wave of innovation is the green technologies, who's going to lead that? Very important question, because whoever does will rule the world. Tom Friedman, last week, very interesting piece in the New York Times, have a nice day. He pointed out that Applied Materials, an American company, in the last two years, built 14 solar manufacturing facilities around the world. How many of them on American soil? None. Zero. None. China, Germany, India, Korea, none on American soil. In October, Applied is opening the world's largest solar research facility in China. And Tom points out, China understands it cannot pollute its way to prosperity because it would choke to death. The life expectancy in China has been going down because of its use of petroleum-fueled cars, because of its coal plants. China knows it cannot continue. Tom said, this is the most important shift in the world in the last 18 months. China has decided that clean tech is going to be the next global industry and is now creating a massive domestic market for solar and wind that will give it a great export platform. China's deadly serious about this. City after city after city, the mayors are realizing that the sunset industries are killing its people. Uh, Mayor Yu Quin in Baoding, the existing car factories were polluting a lake. They had a massive fish kill. Uh, you can imagine what to do with a lake worth of dead fish. He said, that's it. We're done polluting. We're going green. And the city is now investing in 200 renewable energy companies for export. This is a megawatt grid integrated on a roof in China. They're putting solar on yurts. They're building buildings that have solar integrated into the buildings. And they've just announced the construction of a two gigawatt solar array in Mongolia. A gigawatt is roughly a nuclear-sized chunk of electricity. The 11th Party Congress decided to change China's industrial policy. It is now based on what they call the circular economy, zero waste. Then you get the inevitable question, ah, but is there a business case? Yeah, as a matter of fact, there is, and you ignore it at your peril. We call it the integrated bottom line. You may have heard the phrase, the triple bottom line. You profit, and then you add on to it people and planet. Well, that, looking at it that way makes those into cost centers. This is a bit of a hard sell. Suppose we ask, what is it that constitutes shareholder value? Good Milton Friedman economics. And you recognize that profit is part of it. And the companies that are investing in squeezing out waste are the most profitable in today's world. Driving innovation. I mean, this is what Applied Materials is doing. It's driving innovation, but it's going overseas. Reducing risk. The lawsuits have all already been filed against companies for not managing their carbon footprint and for polluting. 
Getting and keeping the best talent. Young people today want to work with sustainable companies. Enhancing labor productivity. If you build good green buildings, you will get 6 to 16% higher labor productivity. Enhancing market share, branding, product differentiation. This is why you see even Exxon now putting up green ads. <laughs> Supply chain management. This is why Walmart is going green. Walmart has 60 to 90,000 suppliers. And as of this July, they have published a 15-question index that they are requiring all their suppliers to answer. The first question is, are you measuring and managing your carbon footprint? Second question, are you reporting on that through the Carbon Disclosure Project? And it goes on to how do you use materials and what's your impact on the environment and water and resources and the community? Walmart, the evil empire. Walmart is going green and they are taking the manufacturing world with them because they're reducing the cost of distrust. The companies that get it right will be first to the future. We're talking about the billionaires of tomorrow. And we now have 17 separate studies from wide-eyed environmentalists like Goldman Sachs showing that the companies that are the leaders in environment, social, and good governance policy have 25% higher stock value. The Economist Intelligence Unit, the companies with the highest share price growth over the past three years paid more attention to sustainability. Conversely, the worst performing companies in the economy were most likely to have nobody in charge of sustainability. You've heard this phrase, yeah? Don't take a risk. The second mouse gets the cheese. Come on, guys. We need to be like this little feller. Let's put on a helmet and go for it. <laughs> this is also a moral issue. The Maldives. Height of land, eight feet. I was two weeks ago in the Philippines with the energy minister of the Maldives who was saying, how do we invest our money? And I said, you'd better buy a new country because they are not going to survive global warming. It's a race. Will the Maldives or Vanuatu be the first country to go underwater? But they're going under. And we're doing it to them. We've learned to walk on the moon. Though, uh, even on the moon, we needed a car. <laughs> it was solar powered, I'll give them that. We have not yet learned to walk on Earth. We need new leadership. And I rather like this line from Lord of the Rings, where Gandalf said, the rule of no realm is mine, but all worthy things that are in peril as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair and bear fruit and flower again in the days to come. For I, too, am a steward, did you not know? It's not a bad maxim. And remember, it was these two, the fun-loving, unassuming little hobbits who lived in the Shire, who took on their shoulders this awesome task. And they were scared. They didn't know where they were going. But in the end, all the kings and warriors and wizards could just stand by as the little people saved the world. I think real leadership is extraordinary courage by ordinary people. This is the only place in all the universe we know of where there is life, and we're the only ones who can take care of it. So I'm deeply grateful, David, that you wrote your book, that you're doing what you're doing. Daryl, thank you for getting arrested. I asked my students, should I go? And they said, no, no, stay and teach class. But I wanted to be there. And Ed, you've been, you've been a great leader in this. As long as anybody, thank you. And thank you all for caring enough to come. Thanks. Thank you, Hunter. That was just great. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. I will now uh, pass the microphone, or she has her own microphone. We're going to hear from my dear friend, Daryl Hanna, who's been doing this sort of stuff in transportation, powering vehicles with vegetable oil, with alcohol, with biofuels, all kinds of stuff. My dear friend, Daryl Hanna, please. Um, 
Can you hear me? Um, uh, so excited. I, I, was, I met David, um, oh gosh, I don't know, quite a few years ago.